Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our DATIQ weekly market update. This is our update for Halloween 2023. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics over here at DAT, joined by Dean Croak, who's our Principal Industry Analyst. Very special guest this morning, we have Lee Clasco, who is a Senior Analyst at Bloomberg for the Transportation and Logistics Sector. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. What, did you, what are you guys going for for Halloween this year? Uh, I'm hiding. But you're hiding. You're I, I was going to be. I was going to be really something really scary. I was going to be a, a spot truckload grades. Oh, <laughs> timely. Uh, I was going to be a Michigan fan, but that would be cheating. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's um. It's quite the Halloween this year. Thankfully, in Ohio, they do trick or treat on the weekends, and we won't have to be walking through three to five inches of snow tonight in blowing, um, blowing fresh snow um, with the kids. And then they would all get sick, and then I'd get sick, and then it would be a nightmare. So that's the true reprieve yeah. this year. Yeah. So, Hearing Lee, do uh, you want to give folks a. You've been on before, um, pretty well known in the transportation space, but for those that may not be familiar with you or new to our program, do you mind doing a quick intro? Sure. Uh, I'm uh, Lee Klatkow. Um I am the senior uh, analyst and sector head over at Bloomberg Intelligence uh, for freight transportation logistics research. Uh, Bloomberg Intelligence is uh, the company's research arm. Uh, we provide research across pretty much all asset classes, all industries. So we cover from the equity fixed income side. We do commodities. Um, I cover railroad, trucking, 3PLs, uh, and marine shipping, uh, pretty much anything that anything that uh, moves stuff. I don't cover the movement of people. So uh, that's kind of my main coverage. I've been doing it for a little better than 20 years, about 15 of those years here at Bloomberg, and uh, the rest of the time uh, as a Wall Street analyst uh, covering stock. Awesome. Well, we're very lucky to have you on this morning. Um, we're going to run through our market update here and then bring you back to talk about some of those spooky spot truckload rates, if that sounds good with you. Sounds great. All right. I'm kind of disappointed we haven't littered uh, this week's key points with a ton of Halloween puns, but we'll power through. Um, that's our miss. Uh, so spot rates are continuing that roller coaster ride down again. Um, we're not seeing seasonality seasonality prevail here, which I think is a very interesting trend. Now we've got average contract rates for van and reefer bouncing around from week to week. Those replacement rates are down uh, about one to four percent, depending on equipment type, um, and they're up a little bit in flatbed. Uh, fall pro produce, Thanksgiving, and Christmas tree season uh, are set to start this week. That'll be very important to track um, to see if seasonality can start to exert itself. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in our short-term forecasts um, after Dean's update. The ATA tonnage index dropped 1.1% month over month and 4.1% year over year. Uh, Bob Costello over there at ATA is warning about choppy waters ahead. I tend to agree with him. Um, and then sort of somewhat breaking news, the six-week UAW auto strike ends in an agreement with the big three is reached. That was news as of yesterday. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Dean for our long Warm market update, Dean. Yeah, thanks, Ken. Let's start off with the drive and load to truck ratio. Uh, spot market load post decreased last week about 5%. That's very typical, though, in late October. That's typically the low point in spot market volumes before seasonality starts to lift the overall market. Uh, load post is still about 35% lower than this time last year. Load to truck ratio flat this week at 202 .02. In the refrigerated market, uh, after being flat for the last couple of weeks, uh, volumes dipped last week, carrier equipment posts also down. Load to truck ratio is 2.90. That's the lowest refrigerated load to truck ratio in seven years. Uh, just giving us an indicator of how soft the reefer market is nationally. And in flatbed, uh, followed the same dry van and reefer volume uh, sort of trends down last week. Volumes in flatbed, though, are about half what they were a year ago. Load to truck ratio, the lowest in seven years, at 6.11 loads per truck. Having a look at a couple of our markets, um, except for California, the nation's top five spot markets, that's California, Illinois, Georgia, New Jersey, and Texas, all reported a decrease in average outbound spot rates last week, all down in the one to two cent per mile range. California, though, average rates were up a penny per mile, state average sitting at just under $2 a mile at $1.99. Uh, based on rate trends in pre-pandemic years, California's outbound rates have the potential to increase another $0.10 cents a mile before year end. 
And uh, on the high volume Los Angeles to Phoenix Lane, rates are at 308 per mile. Remember, folks, this is excluding fuel at $3.08. That's the highest in 12 months and about 23 cents a mile higher than September. Uh, outbound rates in Illinois followed a similar cooling trend to Texas. Um, Illinois rates were down to 2.04 per mile, 204, down one cent per mile week over week. Similar story in New Jersey. Average outbound rates only $1.40 per mile and are just half what they were at the end of 2021 and about five cents per mile higher than in 2019. And in refrigerated, uh, having a look at the Pacific Northwest, of course, where seasonality is making a big difference. We've got fall produce and Christmas tree season starting to move the needle there. At 207 per mile, outbound reefer rates in the PNW, including Washington, Oregon and Idaho, up two cents a mile and eight cents a mile year over year. Outbound reefer rates uh, average 205 in Spokane, while in the larger Twin Falls markets, rates average $2.30 per mile. In the flatbed market, um, at $1.89 uh, per mile, outbound Texas state average rates are identical to this time in 2018 and about a cent per mile higher than 2019. Uh, line haul rates in Texas have dropped by almost 50 cents a mile since the start of June this year, although that isn't unusual based on the trends in past years in the largest uh, spot bed market, uh, spot market flatbed spot rates are up five cents a mile in Houston, averaging 206. Um, some pretty strong gains on the Lubbock lane out in the Permian Basin. A lot of oil field supplies move on that lane. Houston to Lubbock paid carriers $2.28 per mile last week. That's up four cents per mile a week over week. And in uh, our year-over-year -year look at spot rates to wrap up our market update, uh, line haul rates erased the prior week's gains last week down one cent per mile. Uh, at the end of October, the national average was $1.56 per mile. That's 20 cents a mile lower than this time last year. And compared to our top 50 lanes based on the volume of loads moved, they averaged $1.86 per mile last week. That's around 30 cents per mile higher than the national average of 156. In refrigerated, at just over $1.87 per mile, reef and line haul spot rates are about 21 cents a mile lower than this time last year. Although rates were down about two cents per mile last week, we do expect them to start moving up shortly. Um, in the Pacific Northwest, produce volumes are, are a little bit higher than last year. But overall, the biggest uh, impact on the produce market and the reefer spot market is California. It represents about 25% of truckload volume last week. Uh, volumes in California are down about 18% year over year. Um, compared to this time last year, uh, where there are only two of 16 produce growing regions reporting a surplus of trucks, the USDA reported nine regions having a surplus of trucks last week. That's nine out of about 16. And lastly, in flatbed, after being flat for almost all of October, rates decreased by a cent per mile to an average of 187 last week, 20 cents a mile lower than this time last year, and just two cents a mile higher than in 2019. That's it for this week's market update. Remember, if you want to find out more about what's happening in freight, go to dat.com forward slash market update and download our long form version of this report. That'll be up on our website sometime later this evening. Over to you, Ken, for the short term forecast. Hey, Kadeen. So we're going to start with uh, dry van, like we always do. This is um, all these rates exclude fuel. They're all long haul only. Um, and they go back to June 1st, just to give you some idea of context. So you have a seven day weighted moving average. That's the blue line. And again, that's long haul, line haul, excluding fuel. Uh, and then we have four forecast models. We have red, which is the short term forecast. We have green, which is rate cast. Uh, and then we have a yellow and a gray, which is um, sort of like an intermediate blend of the two um, to varying degrees. And I think what you see here is the models are really, just like last week, generally aligned in their direction. Um, they're just a little bit, um, let's just call it, um, they're a little disagreeable on where, like what level it's going to be at. So you can look at um, a couple of the blended forecasts have a little bit more of an optimistic view over where the next 35 days are going to head. Um, you've got Raycast starting off pretty much in line with the short term model and then bouncing up. Um, to meet the other models and the most pessimistic of all being the short term model. It's really going to pick up on a lot of that recent negativity in the spot market um, and it's going to carry that through um, basically through Thanksgiving and the end of November. So let's move on to reefer. So you're starting to see the backside of the seasonality here with reefer. What I mean by that is you're starting to see where it typically dips back down over Thanksgiving before rallying into the end of the year. Um, models are very much in agreement here. Very little 
room. You see a little bit there towards the middle of November, um, but not much uh, separation at all here. Um, this is a pretty strong seasonal push for refrigerated chipping. Um, and then, like I said, it typically dips back down and then has a really strong finish to December, something to keep in mind. And then the most boring of all, um, the model's in agreement, and it's in agreement that the, the trend is going to be generally flat for flatbed, um, which, again, keeping with our trend of terrible puns today, um, I think that's apropos here for the flatbed forecast, as all, more, all four models are in agreement. Um, that pretty much covers the short-term forecast for this week. As we get into December, a couple weeks, we'll run our long-term and bring that on to the show to discuss. But that being said, we got through our portion of the show, and we're going to bring Lee back for our question of the week in discussion. Yeah, thanks, Ken. So, Lee, some economic signals are strong and suggest that demand might be increasing. Real GDP grew 4.9% in the last quarter. Um, inflation trended down. So how do you see peak season... Uh, panning out in the first half of next year. Um, you know, the economy seems to be growing based on recent data. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I'd say uh, we're cautiously optimistic. Uh, we do think we're going to see, start seeing some seasonal uptick in demand. Um, you know, not necessarily a robust or strong peak season, just a seasonal increase that we normally see. Um, you know, maybe not maybe not so much a peak, more like a speed bump, if you will, uh, of demand growth. Uh, so, you know, that coupled with uh, what tends to be a very strong consumer right now, the consumer has been extremely resilient um, during this whole freight recession that, you know, we've all been living through. Uh, and that resiliency appears to have some um, uh, tailwinds behind it. You know, what I would say is that obviously consumers are, they've gone through their savings that they uh that they were able to stockpile away during the pandemic. Um, you know, they're, they're feeling the, the pinch of inflation. Um, you know, the Fed probably is gonna keep uh, rates uh, flat uh, this time with a possible another increase in December, depending where the economy goes. And, you know, as interest rates continue to inch up, that's also gonna hurt consumers' wallets and could limit, you know, overall demand for freight in the first half. And again, the good news is, is that I think we're coming off of easier comparisons in the first half. So we might see growth. That growth might not necessarily mean that there's strength there. It just means that compared to last year of that time in the first half, things just look a little better, at least from a freight standpoint. Yeah, so to get the big so question get, out of the way, um, when, when do you see things starting to get into kind of earnest recovery mode next year? And there's a lot of consensus, but I think there's also a lot of kind of outlier type opinions on when that might happen. I'm curious to get your thoughts. You know, we've been relatively bullish uh, on, on the truckload space in terms of thinking that we're at the bottom. Uh, uh, and the, the real surprise on rates has been on the supply side. Uh, we would have thought a lot more supply would have come out of the market, especially given a lot of trucking companies that went into the spot market, these uh, small owner operators uh, went in with higher cost equipment and that coupled with you know, the high cost that everyone else was dealing with makes running a truck very difficult. Uh, I was at the ATA conference a couple of weeks ago and uh, their chief economist and all around great guy, Bob Costello had a, a slide that showed, uh, he thought that the, their savings would pretty much run its course uh, which, which could mean that we could see an acceleration of capacity leaving the spot market, which unfortunately is needed to, to push rates higher because it's probably not going to come much on the demand side because, because of everything that we talked about earlier. You know, we're not expecting strong demand. We're just expecting some growth. Uh, and that growth might be, you know, low single digits, and that won't be enough to really move the needle that far unless supply comes out of the market. Yeah, I think that aligns with kind of my thinking. Probably you're going to blow past what we thought was equilibrium. We thought we'd probably achieve what the this month or maybe even early November we would have achieved that balance yeah. um, in the trucking capacity. We probably have added to the, another runway of maybe seven thousand more more uh, authorities we need to see come out of the market before we hit equilibrium. Mm -hmm. um, but I think our position is pretty similar that the balance is going to come on the supply side, not necessarily on the demand side. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's been really, you know, interesting to watch, uh, you know, because I, I cover not only the industries, but I cover the individual public companies. 
Uh, you know, the truckload companies uh, as a group, uh, according to the Bloomberg Intelligence Peer Group, they're down around 10% year to date. And the LTL company, they're up something like 47, 48% year to date. It's really a, a tale of two cities uh, uh, for, within the trucking market. You know, LTL has been extremely strong and truckload has been extremely weak. Uh, and, you know, yellow going out of business really helped uh, the remaining players in the LTL space uh, consolidate that market and keep that, that strong price environment that we've seen for the last four or five years, uh, give that more legs uh, for, for the LTL carriers. And you're going to see, you know, rates excluding fuel probably go mid, mid to high single uh, digit increases uh, into 2024. Yeah, I just saw so yeah. Zaya put a seven and a half percent forward. Was it? Is it? Was that the headline I read correctly yesterday? Yeah, Something. yeah, I think uh, on their contracts. Yeah, that's wild, right? I mean, FedEx and UPS were five nine, I think. Yeah, I, I'm not sure of that. Are you talking about the GRI or just what they're? Yeah, their contract? GRI. Oh, um, that I'd have to double check. Yeah, seven and a half percent. Yeah. Effective December 4th. They pulled it forward and they made it seven and a half percent. Yeah, they're, they're, it's a much more consolidated market, you know, around you know, yellow had around 10 percent of shipments uh, before it went under. It was the third largest uh, LTL carrier. Uh, and, and so you know, all that freight went up for grad. Um, you know, all, all of them are, have benefited. You know, we've just had third quarter earnings uh, for, for most of the uh, the LTL carriers, and they all reported really strong uh, demand numbers. They reported strong pricing numbers. Uh, and as I said earlier, that, that further consolidation of the market is really going to help support higher rates, which is very different, obviously, than the truckload market, which is extremely fragmented, especially when you look at the spot market. You know, you have a lot of... Um, you, Maybe little un, less sophisticated players uh, relative to the, the truck, the truckload contractual market, uh, and, and a lot of those folks are, you know, willing to take freight at any rate just to pay, you know, the cost for their truck or their insurance, just to pay their bills, not necessarily to, uh, you know, earn a profit. Yeah, Dean, you yeah. have a question. Dean, I feel yeah. like I'm monopolizing. I could sit here all day. Yeah, no, that's, that's, um, I do have one question. Lee, um, kind of economics 101, one of the things that I see some of the economists talking about is the relationship between higher interest rates and stymied business investment. And then the, you know, the flip side of that is if interest rates come down uh, at some point in the new year, then that could stimulate business investment and in turn demand for freight that carriers haul. Can you talk about that intersection of interest rates and business investments and what the, what the future may look like there? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, the higher the rates are, is is the higher interest rates are, is, is the higher the return hurdle that businesses have to overcome to make that investment worthwhile. You know, just think about, you know, you, you wouldn't you wouldn't spend five percent on a loan to make four percent in uh, you know income. So you know, you have to get above that five percent rate, and we've seen rates, you know, obviously pick up pretty considerably given the Fed move. Uh, and so companies, some companies might be less willing to make investments, whether that's in expanding their own businesses or in particular pro uh, projects, because that uh, return hurdle just might be too high and they may not be able to get to it. Uh, obviously, the, the free money environment that we that we all loved and enjoyed, you know, when we, had, when we were able to get a mortgage at 3% versus, uh, you know, 8%, uh, we'd, all, we'd all rather be back there. Um, yes, lower interest rates tend to stimulate the economy more. Um, you know, part of the problem with where we are in inflation, it was overstimulated, and we need to work out that um, that excess out of the market. And that's what the Fed is trying to do: is trying to you know slow down the overall economy with higher rates. That's really the the, the 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 crux of what they're doing: is they're increasing interest rates with the hope. That people will be spending more in business, or sorry, people will be spending less, and businesses will be spending less. You know, for us personally, if you have a credit card, you know, you would you be paying if you're not paying off your credit card bill every month. You know, your interest rates all of a sudden in the high 20s, which is uh, pretty high, uh, and so you might think twice about maybe overextending yourself. Uh, what I would say, uh, you know, you mentioned G the GDP print, which is pretty positively. Uh, the U.S. consumer is, is pretty resilient. 
the U.S. economy is 70 percent uh, on, on the consumption side. And, um, you know, most Americans aren't afraid to use their credit card um, to overextend themselves uh, to get that latest whatever they, they wanted or thought they needed. Um, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, you're going to you know, we're going to be here for a long time um, or, you know, maybe not a long time, but we're going to be here for a while in a high interest rate environment because it's going to take some time to kind of um, uh, to get the excess out of the market. Um, and, you know, I'm not an economist. I don't play one on TV. So I don't know really uh, exactly when that's going to be. Uh, but, you know, it does. A lot of people have been talking about um, the fact that the U.S. economy might, um, you know, have a soft landing, which means they're not gonna, we're not going to go into a recession. That's been actually our base case for quite some time. Uh, we, we believe that we could get into a, a soft landing. Obviously, you know, the Fed has to, it's, it's almost like landing a plane in fog. It has to do it perfectly or, uh, you know, we, we could have um, a major issue on our hands. Uh, but, you know, I'm relatively optimistic that they're able to, they're going to be able to navigate that. Uh, and you know maybe keep rates high for a while and then start peeling them back um, when 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 demand and and, and inflation uh, kind of subsides and that's the main goal is to take get that inflation number down uh, which to your point you mentioned earlier uh, that number has been decelerating which which is uh, a, a net positive positive. and for the other thing to consider too in addition to all that is the cost it's not just interest rate if you think of interest rates as a proxy for the cost of money it's 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 hitting logistics especially hard, right? Inventory becomes a lot more expensive to carry, which means, you know, by and large, retailers and all shippers are generally less incentivized to carry inventory. I think also if you're in the brokerage space, you know, th there is a decided difference between when your shippers are paying you and when you're paying your carriers. And that difference is float, and that float has gotten monumentally more expensive. Um, so I think that's something to really keep in mind in this interest rate environment, especially as you're budgeting for next year. Uh, this is especially as a brokerage of any medium size or large size. This is when you get a bite at the apple to reset your expectations on fuel, on interest rates, and things like that. Mm. And I'd be extra mindful as we head in the next year um, what your assumptions are there because mm. there's a pretty good chance that current environment in those areas stick for most of the year, wouldn't you say, Dean, Lee? I would. I mean, I was struck by a conversation I had with my wife this week about uh, the cost of doing business in a catering business. Their revolving line of credit interest rates are skyrocketing. So that affects shippers and carriers who need a revolving line of credit to carry their debtors. I think it's affecting you know a lot of our businesses at that level also as they think about next year's budget. Yeah, and also factoring. Um, you know, a lot of trucking companies uh, use factoring, so that they're going to get even less of their uh, accounts uh, receivables than they might have gotten a year ago because of that higher interest rate. So, you know, not only do they have higher costs, but they're, they're, and, they're and the rates are down, but they might even get less of that because of the higher interest associated with uh, factoring their uh, accounts receivable. Yeah, plus allowance for, not to get kind of too far down the MBA path, but right, like the allowance for bad debt goes up because you're seeing a higher percentage of defaults um, and if you're starting to run hot there, you have to make a decision to increase your allowance for bad debt, um, especially if you're a medium to large size carrier. I think that's kind of, that's the side of the industry. And I do have a convoy question coming up for you in a minute, Lee, but you know, if you're a billion dollar brokerage and you all of a sudden poof out of existence, you're probably carrying three to $5 million worth of current payables on the, on the, on the balance sheet and against what a $75,000 bond to be a broker. So I think as you're a carrier um, of any substantial size, it's a pretty large risk you're not going to get paid there. Um, and I think it's something to be mindful of as we head into next year, as we as we start to maybe smooth out the bumps, but don't smooth them out entirely. Um, so I guess that pivots me, Lee, to the convoy question. That's probably the biggest news to happen uh, since our podcast last week. Um, how do you think, do you think that's the end of it um, from a big name um, wind down, or do you think there's more coming in the brokerage space? You know, I think Convoy was a very specific scenario. Um, you had um, a darling in, in, in not only in the industry, but also in the investment community, uh, someone that, you know, dubbed itself as a disruptor. And, you know, what it was doing, it was trying to build scale with price, and meaning 
they were losing money on probably most loads that they that they tendered. So um, that's probably not a good business model. Uh, it's a it's a better business model when interest rates are cheap uh, and financing is cheap and private equity and VC or have blank checks. You know, right now a lot of uh, VC and private equity folks uh, are not opening their checkbooks. They're waiting for what they see as maybe other opportunities as the economy kind of uh, unwinds. Uh, you know, if those people that are more bearish in the world think that we're going to a recession or there's going to be maybe more of an opportunity in commercial real estate, uh, they're keeping their powder dry. So uh, you have uh, that side of the in investment uh, community uh, maybe not you know, like I said, writing checks as, as freely as they once were in a lower uh, cost of capital environment. And then you that coupled with the fact that they were losing money on every load uh, or most loads, um, you know, is a reason. You have other technology first companies that are trying to build scale. Now, you know, like if you look at uh, Amazon's brokerage business, you know, uh, I don't know what they're doing on a load basis, but assuming you know they were doing a similar strategy, they have Amazon, they have the uh, um, you know all their businesses uh, to kind of um, um, uh, you, you know pay for uh, those those uh, th those loads. So uh, it, it's a very different model, uh, you know. But but you, you know if you're a shipper or if you're uh, uh, a, a truckload carrier, you know, you really have to vet your your broker partner as well uh, to make sure that you know a your freight's going to get where it needs to be, or you're going to get paid. Yeah, it's nice to have fifty billion dollars of free cash flow coming in from AWS every year to finance kind of whatever else you want to do as Amazon. I mean, that's yeah, that's and, and they're, they're able to subsidize you know these businesses and you know and amazon you know as you know they're building this freight broker business not to make money they're building it to lower their costs to deliver uh the business the, the freight and, and and products that they're trying to sell on their network um so it's, so it's a much different model um but, you know if you have these technology first companies that are trying to build scale um you know you, you really should take a, a close look at them you know, then you have like companies like, you know, J.B. Hunt, whose brokerage business is not doing well, but, you know, they're a diversified uh, company. Um, their brokerage business is not only, you know, they not only want that to be a profit center long term, uh, but it's also a, a strategic business for them um, to be able to feed uh, their asset based businesses. Uh, so, you, you know, there, there's very there's a lot of different business models, uh, but the technology first. Uh, trying to build uh, density and, and, and share at, at by using rates is a uh, you know a difficult model uh, to say the least right now. Yeah, I mean people have been losing money for hundreds of years in business. I don't know that that necessarily makes you a disruptor. Plus, I don't. I'm not sure that you can call like if you have to call yourself a disruptor. Are you a disruptor? I don't know. <laughs> like, I feel like that's a title that only others can bestow upon you. That, that's not meant as negative towards Convoy, but. Yeah. Um, well, what, what we've seen is a lot of the, the technology first brokers be kind of try to morph into more of a traditional broker and the traditional brokers trying to morph into a technology broker. You know, I think the right uh, model is somewhere in between where the technology is making your brokers a lot more productive uh, and a lot more efficient and a lot more profitable for the business owner. I think that's really where it's at. Uh, the, the world where, you know, it's fully automated and you're not talking to humans. Uh, or there's no human interaction because, as you know, um, you know you don't need to talk to somebody unless the you know what hits the fan, uh, and you have an exception, and you need to figure out where's my freight, where's my truck, where's you know wh where's where's Waldo. I don't know, but you have to figure out where things are, and you want to talk to a human, and, and that's where these brokers come into play. You know, like 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 you know we like you because know, I, I cover uh, C.H. Robinson. You know, we like what they're doing on the technology side. Uh, JB Hunt's been making some great investments in the technology side. Um, RxO, which you know I don't cover, but I used to cover them when they were part of XPO. You know, again, they're leveraging technology to make their brokers a lot more, a lot more efficient. Yeah, there's this perception that if you walk into CH Robinson's brokerage floor, they're gonna be running punch cards in the corner, right? Like this is not the case. I mean, all of these brokers are massively investing in technology. And I guess the last point to make before we bring bring it home to plugs here is. Um, 
people really struggle. We just had a large man, you know, one of the top management consultant firms in uh, here at DAT. And I think even they struggle to understand um, brokerage isn't a bunch of easy to move freight just by its nature, right? It gets there for a reason, right? The easiest freight moves private and dedicated. From there, it moves on kind of scheduled contracts. The stuff that spills over largely into the spot market is kind of your unplanned, your fall off, your one off. It's the hardest freight to move. So by trying to leverage automated technologies here, you're immediately tackling the worst, most gnarly problems in our space. And to lead to your point, it's the ones you oftentimes have to pick up the phone and talk um, about. I'm not saying it's not possible. It's by far the most difficult. Um, it's like, you know, pitching your first game in the World Series of the major, of major League Baseball versus Little League. It's like a different, it's a, it's a different realm, if you will, in terms of difficulty. But yeah, and I, and I would also, I would say there's almost a bifurcation in the spot market. You have that freight on one side and then you have the totally commoditized, don't care about service, just got to get it somewhere cheap um, um, shippers as well. And you have that freight in the market as well, you know, as well. So I, I, I would say that it's, maybe a, a bifurcation of, of the market where, you know, the stuff in the middle is probably the sweet stuff uh, for the contractual market that, uh, you know, a lot of the publicly traded carriers that I cover, you know, that's really what business is there in. They're either in dedicated or contractual one way uh, of business, which is, um, you know, more about relationship building or they're at least they've been trying to through the cycles to be more strategic with their shipper uh, and build their long-term relations versus I don't care who, who takes my freight as long as it gets there and it gets there cheap. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately, that's at least my belief anyway, where kind of the, the, the upper bound of where automated freight matching in the brokerage space asymptotes is probably where that, the, the hairy edge of that bifurcation. I don't think mm -hmm. it like the, the the team has mat load that picks up on a Friday and has to go straight through and deliver on Monday morning halfway across the country. Um, and it has to be placarded and it's a team load with, um, you know, a sealed trailer. I don't think you're going to run that through an automated freight matching solution anytime soon, at least not at current technology and adoption, right? The, the reams of paper going from Chicago to Atlanta on a Monday on a non-day definite delivery, sure, <laughs> right? Like price it, pick it up, go. Um, right. So, it'll be an interesting time. All right, Dean, we're running we're running long here. Uh, get us home with some plugs. Yeah, big news this week. Uh, in conjunction with our partners, OTR Solutions, we launched the new DAT1 fuel card yesterday. 8,000 locations accepted at. Uh, carriers can get about 44 cents off the posted cash price. Um, drivers also, lots of folks out celebrating Halloween this evening. The roads are going to be dark. Lots of people be extra vigilant. Uh, with people in masks throwing things off overpasses. Yes, it happens. Might be a good day to park up early. Sales chatter tomorrow. Uh, don't forget Landline Now, 7 p.m. Sirius XM. And on the latest uh, Freightline podcast, Chris Kaplis is talking to Jim Filter from uh, Schneider about the electronic vehicle revolution and how they've adopted those vehicles in their California drage operation. Next week's show, we have Jeff Dickinson from Rail Logistics talking about uh, carriers and some great advice for them. And with that, it's back to Ken to wrap up the show. All right, Lee, how can folks get a hold of you or uh, grab your material that you're writing on a constant basis? Sure. So I'm on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also on Twitter at Logistics Lee. Uh, actually, I just launched a couple of weeks ago a new pod, Bloomberg podcast on transports uh, called uh, Talking Transports. Uh, you can get that at Bloomberg.com or on Sound, SoundCloud. Uh, it's going to go out on the uh, other major channels in a, in a couple of weeks. Uh, we've had five episodes under our belt, um, you know, kind of talking to high level folks in uh, the freight transportation markets. Uh, this month, I'm going to be speaking with uh, the CEOs of uh, Canadian National and um, uh, CSX, so excited about that. Uh, also, in prior episodes, we have uh, a couple uh, ones with uh, conversations with the CEO from uh, RxO, which we discussed earlier today, GxO, uh, Starbulk, which is a dry bulk carrier, so pretty much covering all, all the modes of transportation, so check it out if, if you're interested. Thank you very much for that. And we really appreciate you coming on. Um, maybe we'll have you on uh, as we start rolling in the next year to see how some of our prognostication is coming true as we head into 24. 
Yeah. So with that, um, we're going to wrap up for this week. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, if you're heading out tonight, I would advise heating deeds warning. There's going to be some gnarly weather coast to coast, um, and it's a little spooky this time of year. So mm -hmm. with that, we will see you next week. Yep. Have a safe week, and thanks for joining us.